<laughs> yes? Yes, okay. Right, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I have listened very carefully this morning to what has been said, and it struck me that um, in line with a rather famous and much loved comedy show uh, from the UK, uh, people of my generation anyway, um, I feel I ought to say, uh, well, and now for something completely different. Um, I'm not absolutely sure it is completely different, um, but I do feel a little bit nervous uh, about presenting what is essentially uh, a social science and qualitative perspective um, on a subject that I've been hearing so much medical engineering and technical know-how about this morning. Um, so uh, with that um, caveat, uh, I, I will try to proceed. Um, what I want to talk about today uh, is the result actually uh, of two um, comparative studies that we've carried out uh, at Cardiff over the last few years. Um, and um, although I say in this slide that the, um, the study I'm going to focus most on um, is one that was supported, funded by the UK Institution of Occupational Safety and Health um, on the experience of representing workers on safety and health in coal mines in five different countries. Um, in fact, uh, quite a lot of what I'm saying uh, will come from the study that preceded that, which was a study that we did in Australia, in Queensland to be specific, um, looking at the same issue but in, in a more narrowly focused way. Um, and I want to make it clear from the outset that um, I'm talking mostly about worker representation, so I'm actually talking about trade unions and trade union representation, um, and I'm therefore talking about the formal mining sector, mostly large uh, workplaces, large organizations, large companies. Um, and I am not making any claim that the situation in the informal sector um, is not a good deal uh, of more concern than what I'm talking about, but I, I, I think we we, we shouldn't um, just form the opinion that the formal sector, everything is kind of hunky-dory because I don't actually think it is. Anyway, um, what, uh, what the uh, studies we've been involved in have tried to do um, is to explore the development and present practice uh, in a range of different uh, socioeconomic conditions um, of the role of worker representation on health and safety in coal mining and we've tried um, in some places at least where we've been able to to examine the evidence for the effectiveness of the arrangements for representing health and safety interests of mine workers uh, in coal mines um, and to identify the factors that contribute to supporting this. Uh, I, I, I will discuss the role of the state through regulation and inspection, trade unions, employers and global influences such as that of ILO Convention 176, uh, which does have, under Article 13, um, quite specific uh, uh, standards for uh, the rights of mine workers uh, to information and to withdraw from dangerous work, as well as to uh, select members of their own workforce uh, to represent them in matters of health and safety in consultations both with their employers and with the regulatory authorities. So at the global level, the provisions for worker representation in occupational health and safety in coal mining are quite clear. Um, and I'd like to offer some reflections on the significance of these matters for ways of understanding health and safety practice in coal mines. Okay, so what do we know so far? Um, I've been uh, doing research 
studies um, around issues of labour relations in occupational health and safety for rather longer than I care to remember. Um, and uh, I think I can say fairly authoritatively that there is now strong research evidence of a positive association between the presence of trade union supported health and safety representatives and improved health and safety outcomes in many sectors. I'm not talking about mining, I'm talking about um, the economy as a whole. Because until recently, there was actually fairly little evidence specifically in mining and in coal mining even more specifically, which I've always found puzzling, uh, actually, because the, re the regulatory provisions to support this type of participation are older in mining than probably anywhere else in any of the sectors in the economy in the world. Indeed, um, just for the record, uh, they date from 1872 in the UK, in the Coal Mines Act of 1872. Um, there are issues about how effective they were, but nevertheless, those provisions were there. They were the product of parliamentary debates in which workers' interests were strongly represented by MPs uh, who at the time uh, had been elected mainly from amongst the trade union leadership within the UK. I'll come back to some of that later. Um, until we did the Queensland study, um, the only very specific studies that I was able to find that showed a link between improved health and safety performance and the role of trade unions and trade union supported representation were a couple of quantitative studies from the US uh, where they had made a link uh, between better performance in unionized uh, coal mines uh, and uh, the presence uh, of the unions uh, and the uh, measures on improved injury uh, prevention that they had noted. Um, our recent Queensland study uh, suggested that uh, the representatives that represent the workers in the Queensland mines uh, were actually effective in getting important health and safety matters addressed and resolved. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of these studies, I don't have time to do it, um, but for those who might be interested, the original research report that uh, we produced uh, on the Queensland study is available, uh, you can download it for free, it looks like this, it's rather long, um, and um, there are so far published three uh, papers uh, that I've listed on that slide um, and you'll note from those that th they are actually uh, available in journals of labour relations uh, and such like rather than in occupational health and safety journals. Um, that's because their focus is really on what are the determinants uh, in a labour relations sense of the actions that we've observed. Um, but nevertheless, the actions we've observed are, are, are there. Um, okay, so um, what the Queensland study showed uh, was that in Queensland there are particularly strong and detailed regulatory provisions uh, that support union representatives in their activities around health and safety. They actually support two different kinds of representatives. They support site safety and health representatives and they also support what they call industry safety and health representatives, the latter being a small number, three in fact, of uh, trade union full-time officers uh, who are full-time employed in supporting the site safety representatives in their health and safety activities. So it's a kind of two-level system. These representatives have, um, have quite significant rights, as I said. Um, they are able to 
uh, do the normal things of representing workers and um, taking part in joint inspections and the, the, the in industry ones have access, rights of access to uh, workers in the coal mines in the state. Um, but they also have uh, rights to review health and safety management systems and they have rights to um, stop what they regard as dangerous uh, operations and they can in fact stop the production of the mine if they so wish. Um, they don't use these rights um, irresponsibly um, and in fact they, they I think the rights are, are much stronger in the effect they have on the legitimacy of the presence of these representatives than they are actually in the actions that they use uh, to, as it were, interfere with the production of the mines. We were able to study the way in which the, these representatives work because the statutory requirements um, have for many years required that um, records are kept of the kinds of inspections that are carried out which meant that we could do a kind of content analysis of records for a substantial proportion of the mines in Queensland over a period, a 10-year period or so, and we could examine them in terms of what did, they, uh, did the representatives actually do during the inspections. It's not an absolute uh, um, perfect way of doing uh, this type of research, but it's a very rich body of data and um, it enabled us to say that in, 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 in more than, I think, 95% of the, um, the reports that we examined, uh, it was possible to see that the representatives had dealt with what we regarded as serious risks. That's mostly serious risks involving the possibility of fatalities and so forth. We used a, a kind of criteria for serious risks that, that one of my colleagues uh, from uh, the University of New South Wales, Michael Quinlan, had developed and it, it's published in his book um, on mining disasters, if you want to refer to it, uh, and it's generally accepted as these are the, um, you know, main uh, most serious risks um, that you're likely to find in coal mines, those were the risks that the representatives engaged with. So the notion that the representatives actually are, are, are really involved in um, uh, superficial or, or peripheral activities, which is what the mining companies were, were trying to suggest, um, we found completely unfounded. We also found that, that they did, um, in most cases, review uh, health and safety management systems uh, quite regularly and um, there were very strong similarities between what was reported by the health and safety representatives in these reports and the reports of regulatory inspectors in the same mines which we also were able to examine because they are also required to be held um, by after they have been done. So. Um, Th this, this was a kind of rich source of information that isn't generally available in um, most other industries, in most other sectors, um, and it enabled us to uh, conclude that uh, these representatives were actually doing a uh, fairly extensive and quite effective um, uh, job in um, contributing to prevention of health and safety. And it occurred to us um, that there were similarities between what was going on in coal mining in Queensland and what goes on in other sectors, where, as I said earlier, the, 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 the main conclusions of research, uh, which has actually included quite a lot of research on uh, relationships between serious and fatal accidents and their incidents and the presence of trade union supported representatives, these similarities were sufficiently similar for us to be able to say that this is further corroboration that these uh, representatives are actually effective. But at the same time, we also thought that there were differences and, and there is a certain uniqueness about mining which is captured partly by its history, uh, partly by the patterns of ownership that you find in mining partly by the, the, the character of labor relations in coal mining and in mining generally, and partly by the seriousness of the hazards that, that uh, we are dealing with here. 
and, and uh, my view is that, that, that these four things uh, um, contribute to a uh, set of uh, characteristics about coal mining which makes it different and makes representation different from what happens perhaps in other sectors. And I think our results, and this last bit is important, uh, our results dispute the conventional analysis of participatory approaches to health and safety because uh, we would argue that our evidence suggests that the improvements we saw were not actually based on cooperation, trust and good relations because cooperation, trust and good relations in the coal mines of Queensland is um, an aspiration that is seldom achieved. It's a very hostile in labour relations environment um, and it suggested to us that if the representatives were able to be effective in this kind of scenario, um, this does suggest alternative ways of framing our analysis in relation to the contexts in which this sort of thing takes place. So moving from there, um, it begged the question, well, okay, you've got these very good provisions in Queensland, you've got quite strong trade unions, you've got uh, um, a, 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 a small and concentrated industry comparatively. Uh, so what happens in other countries and what determines the practice in other countries? So we shifted our attention um, and we looked, as I said on an earlier slide, uh, and practices again in Australia we extended our view to the other main coal mining state in Australia which is New South Wales um, which has broadly a similar arrangement to that to that in Queensland as far as the regulation and the role of the trade unions are concerned um, but we also looked at, at what was going on in another Western uh, um, post-industrial affluent country Canada um, and we extended our, our view then to take account of what is happening in South Africa and in India and in Indonesia. And I'm rather pleased by the serendipity of this morning where people made various references to India, South Africa, Indonesia, so I don't feel that I'm actually speaking to um, an audience with no knowledge whatsoever of these places. Um, so what did we find when we looked at these countries? I'm gonna have to skip through the great detail of this. There is an awful lot of detail, I can assure you. But basically, we found a variety of regulatory approaches that were mostly based on the same historical model to the ones that we saw in Australia. They're not as, very often, were not as advanced uh, in terms of the uh, detailed provisions that they, uh, and rights that they gave to representatives, but they were essentially similar. Um, the only exception was Indonesia, <coughs> where the rights were, were, were very, very perfunctory and, and, and quite limited. However, there was a considerable inconsistency in the application and the effectiveness of these provisions in other countries. Um, in, in, in brief, um, the countries with the, 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 the strong uh, uh, westernized um, uh, historical labor relations um, such as Australia and Canada um, ha had uh, not perfect mm -hmm. application of these measures but better application of these measures than was found in any of the other three countries in the study. Um, in South Africa the regulatory provisions are actually quite strong um, they are, um, well, they were very much emblematic of the post-apartheid uh, regime in, in South Africa and the trade union in South Africa at the time, the National Union of Mine Workers was, of course, instrumental in the overthrow of, of, of apartheid, so it's not surprising, perhaps, that uh, these measures came in in the vanguard of that. They implement the ILO Convention 176 quite uh, um, comprehensively, and they work. Uh, according to our respondents, uh, effectively um, in situations where the trade unions still have quite uh, a strong organization within the mines. This is not uh, comprehensive by any means in South Africa, and uh, I'm not having time to go into the history of um, labor relations in mining in South Africa, but I'm sure some of you are aware that uh, it's been fraught, to put it mildly, over recent years, and the, uh, the hegemony of the NUM is not as it once was in that respect. 
Um, the greatest influence that um, we were able to determine on practices um, are threefold. The regulatory sphere is undoubtedly an important uh, uh, influence and contribution, as are employer and management attitudes and commitment. Normally at this point, if I'm talking about other sectors, then we have some reflections here on the, the supportive role that management and employers play in um, boosting the uh, operation of participative approaches. In the coal mines in uh, the countries that we studied, uh, we were not able to conclude that. Um, we did not find that the um, employers or the management systems for safety that they used as their preference, uh, which were largely behavior-based and behavior-related systems, um, were supportive of any form of autonomous participation. Um, and therefore, um, the employer management attitudes basically were challenging for the uh, uh, application of the regulatory measures. And I would argue that one of the reasons for the poor application of the regulatory measures in some of the countries that we studied uh, was because of that, combined with a much weaker trade union support, uh, uh, a much less mature systems for labor relations within the mines, and a very weak engagement from the mining inspectorate in these mines. Um, so the um, <coughs> in, in, in short, I, my view is that the practice uh, that we observed here was most strongly interested, uh, influenced by the position and the maturity of the institutions of labor relations in the mine. And what I'm trying to say here is that this isn't just about health and safety. This is about labor relations more broadly. And you can have perfect systems of participation on health and safety in theory, but if you apply them in an environment where there are not the supportive structures provided through uh, the institutions of labor relations, whether it's through the collective bargaining agreements or whether it's through the uh, rights for representatives more generally to meet uh, and discuss issues, um, separately from their management and so forth. Uh, if those systems are not in place more generally across the, um, the organization, then the likelihood of measures specifically dealing with participation on health and safety being effective are reduced. Um, which, you know, from a researcher's point of view, it, it, it sort of begs questions about the determinants of effectiveness and, and uh, makes us ask, where are they? Uh, in terms of the statutory provisions, the trade union organization, the role and effectiveness of training. Again, where you have mature systems of industrial relations in place, where you have uh, uh, strong statutory measures, where you have uh, trade union uh, presence and organization within workplaces, all of this tends to focus on provision of training for health and safety representatives. We found over and over again in our studies, when we talked to the representatives themselves, um, they all, whether they were strong, effective representatives or whether they were complaining about their limited uh, roles and so forth, they all identified the need for further training as a very, very strong requirement indeed. And the nature of that training and the extent of it varied enormously across the five countries we studied, but was very strongly correlated with our assessment of the effectiveness of the representatives. Um, so, uh, but again, training doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists within a framework um, of uh, labor relations within an organization uh, that uh, facilitates its provision. Um, and <coughs> uh, I think, the other question that um, I, I wanted to draw attention to here um, is the question of the role of global regulation here. Um, all of the countries that we studied were subject to the ILO Convention, 
Um, but uh, the question of whether they had implemented the provisions of the ILO convention in relation to these matters of representation uh, varied enormously. There is an issue about ratification of the convention, and many of the countries that we studied hadn't ratified the convention, but there wasn't, that didn't seem to be the determining factor. Um, the, the, some of the, the, the uh, uh, Western, European, uh, Western uh, affluent countries hadn't ratified it either. Um, so I'm not sure where uh, ILO conventions actually lie in this um, scenario. Um, the uh, view of our respondents uh, was that they were very important, and certainly the global union federation that represents miners, which is now called Industrial, um, places a strong emphasis on campaigns to get countries like Indonesia to ratify uh, Convention 176. Um, and I'm sure it would be helpful if they, if they did. Um, but what the pressures and the powers of implementation are, uh, I'm less sure of. So I would like to conclude um, by um, asking uh, and reflecting on a few questions about when we're thinking about the role of worker representation in occupational health and safety in mining, and in my case particularly in coal mining, um, uh, I think you know, we need to ask ourselves, well, what is it that works, and for whom does it work, and in what context? Um, it was quite clear from both of our studies that trade union-supported worker representatives are effective in improving health and safety. That's really not the issue. The issue is what supports the implementation of these representatives and enables them to be effective in a world in which the traditional supports for the representation of labor are probably declining rather than increasing, um, generally eroding. Um, so the determinants of effectiveness that um, uh, we've identified in previous studies um, all held true in uh, relation to representation in coal mining, but were varying in the way they were actually uh, implemented and present in uh, the coal mines that we, we looked at. So um, I've already mentioned the, the relative absence of management commitment to these types of uh, um, representative forms of, of um, participation. Similarly, uh, we found huge variation in the engagement uh, of regulatory inspectors, ranging from situations where regulatory inspectors um, were very, very clear at the chief inspector level uh, about the importance that they attached to this form of uh, um, preventive system and how they instructed their mines inspectors to ensure that they met with health and safety representatives and shared their findings with health and safety representatives when they visited uh, mines. We found that in some cases, but we found a complete spectrum uh, ending at the other extreme where we found uh, inspectors who said, well, they don't need health and safety committees or representatives. <coughs> we, we do that. Um, and of course, they didn't. Um, so there, there's, there's significant variation there. Um, there's also, generally, we found the representatives to be very well supported by their co-mining colleagues, by the mine workers themselves. Um, and we found them to be as supported as it was possible to be supported by the trade unions to which they belonged. The trade unions varied enormously in their capacities to um, support uh, this type of workplace representative representation. It's not without a resource, resource implication. And where trade unions are struggling to maintain themselves with particularly in situations with, with eroding membership and so forth, uh, that's not necessarily a given. The wider contexts, of course, uh, are, are fairly obvious, um, and I, I don't want to dwell on, on 
the uh, on 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 those, but um, uh, the increased presence of a, a, a an economic policy that is driven by essentially neo neoliberal precepts doesn't encourage this type of uh, uh, representation. And we found all of these determinants were strongly in evidence in Australia, to a lesser extent in Canada, except for the management commitment that I referred to. Um, the evidence that we found of efforts to marginalize representatives was very often in combination with a very strong support that uh, that the employers and their management, including their health and safety management, uh, gave to the behavior-based safety system that I talked about. The two se seemed to go hand in hand, and they often resulted in uh, representatives telling us that actually what the management do is, yes, they do consult, but they don't consult with us. They consult with other mine workers that they have chosen to consult with in the implementation of their system. So there was an effort to, to sort of um, ignore, even when the, the, the representatives had been elected and were present in the workplace, and there were statutory provisions for them, um, they uh, was an attempt to ignore them. And so uh, these, this form of representation was much less present elsewhere. Um, and I said, as I've said already, strongly related to the the situation of the trade unions in each country, the nature of the economy in those countries, and the maturity of its systems for industrial relations. Um, which, as a social scientist, causes me to reflect on issues around the nature of power, the role of the state, the prevailing political economy in determining the extent of protection of workers' health, safety, and well-being in all workplaces. Um, as well as the contribution that the role that the preferred approach of mining employers was making. Um, and I'm struck here very much by uh, two parallel developments that seem to be going on in, in the world of occupational safety and health management at the moment. You have the, 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 the traditional tripartite, bipartite created uh, participatory approach that is still advocated by the ILO and so forth and then you have the parallel approach to that is advocated by many standards associations to uh, the introduction of safety management systems in which workers participation and particularly autonomous representative participation that role if acknowledged at all is rather minimalized uh, and I think you see two very different systems uh, developing. Um, the latter system, I, I, I guess, is much, much easier for corporations to control than the former system. Uh, there's much less institutional uh, and legitimized resistance built into it, so it's perhaps hardly surprising that corporations tend to uh, favor the latter system. Um, and that, that means um, I wonder something um, about ways of reconsidering uh, the way we frame research on occupational health and safety um, uh, within these contexts. But um, I don't have answers to these questions, um, so I am going to uh, conclude my presentation there, um, rather open-ended. Open um, the message, um, very, very loud and clear from my studies, uh, is that this form of uh, engagement of workers and their representatives in coal mining is uh, a proven and effective way of providing support for preventive systems. It also provides support for more than preventive systems, I think. I think it provides a degree of support for the dignity of workers, and the dignity of workers in mining is a very important issue indeed um, when you think about the conditions under which these workers operate. Um, and I think it's no coincidence from that perspective is if you look back over history, you see the role of representation being uh, a very, very clear 
political message um, very closely linked indeed to the formation and early activities of trade unions. I don't think these are coincidences. But where we sit with these types of issues in modern economies, uh, I think is highly problematic. So I will stop there. Thank you very much.